Today, Bitcoin turns lower after January's job report blows away expectations. MicroStrategy says it lost nearly $200 million, yet Michael Saylor is still bullish on Bitcoin. And Andrew Thurman of Nonsen lays out the future of staked ETH ahead of the Shanghai upgrade. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World, I'm Jordan Smith. Digital currencies are mixed this morning after January's jobs report crushed expectations. The U.S. economy added half a million jobs last month, way, way higher than the 187,000 jobs Wall Street was expecting. As of noon Eastern, Bitcoin dropped to around $23,500. Ether fell more than 1%, but held above the $1,600 level. However, Polygon climbed higher, trading at $1.32. Looking back at the week, Bitcoin is actually up about 3% since last Friday, and that comes on the heels of its best January since way back in 2013. The cryptocurrency's comeback happens as Bitcoin's dominance, or the percentage of crypto's market cap taken up by Bitcoin, rose by as much as 10% since the start of the year. And at the same time, the amount of Bitcoin transacted across exchanges is growing as well. Okay, let's talk about the top stories. First, MicroStrategy's executive chairman, Michael Saylor, joined Squawk on the Street this morning, where he addressed losses at the company he founded. According to the firm's latest earnings report released yesterday, MicroStrategy posted a digital asset impairment charge of more than $197 million on its Bitcoin holdings. During the interview, he said the loss doesn't change the company's strategy around Bitcoin acquisition. Saylor added that he's still bullish on Bitcoin despite the crypto meltdown last year, which he argues was painful in the short term, but necessary over the long term for the industry to, quote, grow up. This industry uh, has some good ideas uh, like uh, digital currencies and assets moving at the speed of light uh, that are unstoppable and a digital commodity that can't be debased. And it also has a lot of entrepreneurs that implemented those good ideas in an irresponsible fashion. What it needs is adult supervision. It needs the Goldman Sachs and the Morgan Stanleys and the Black Rocks to come in the industry. It needs, it needs clear guidelines from Congress. It needs clear rules of the road from the SEC. This, uh, the crypto meltdown has punctuated uh, the problem, has educated everybody on, on it, but also it's, it's underscored the idea that it's time for the world to provide a constructive, uh, transparent framework for digital assets so that we can move the financial system out of the 20th century into the 21st century. Next, federal prosecutors are reportedly investigating Silvergate Capital and its dealings with FTX and Alameda Research. Citing a source familiar with the investigation, Reuters reported that prosecutors in the Justice Department's fraud section are involved in the criminal probe into the crypto-focused bank's dealings. Earlier this week, a bipartisan group of U.S. senators sent a letter to Silvergate asking for details of its risk management practices and its dealings with the now bankrupt crypto exchange. The U.S. Attorney's Office declined to comment. We also reached out to Silvergate Capital, but as of noon Eastern, we didn't hear back. Bloomberg first reported about the investigation, noting that Silvergate hasn't been accused of any wrongdoing and that the inquiry is still in its early stages. The criminal investigation is reportedly looking into Silvergate's hosting of accounts tied to Sam Bankman frieds business. Last, Core Scientific made a deal with the New York Digital Investment Group to pay off an outstanding debt of more than $38 million by giving up thousands of mining machines used as collateral, more than 27,000 to be exact. In this court filing, the firm said the mining rigs were no longer essential to its operations and plans. The crypto mining company acknowledged that the move would negatively impact its revenue, but said that the long-term benefits of paying off debt would outweigh the immediate losses. You might remember Core Scientific filed for bankruptcy protection in December as the company faced the impacts of increased electricity costs and low Bitcoin prices. All right, for our main story, let's continue our conversation from yesterday with Nonsense content lead Andrew Thurman. Crypto World's Tanea McKeel spoke with him about the analytics firm's recent research on liquid staking and what to expect from Ethereum Network's next upgrade, the Shanghai Hard Fork, which will make it possible to withdraw staked ETH. All right, so Andrew, I want you to start by giving us the lay of the land for staked ETH, how it works, how much is out there. But before we even get into that, what even is the appeal for investors versus, you know, just buying some ether and holding it? The transition to proof of stake means that individuals stake their ether, um, locking it into a smart contract um, and earning the right to then... Um, validate blocks um, by attesting to uh, uh, their accuracy or submitting blocks themselves 
um, in exchange for block rewards uh, that way. Um, Ultimately, uh, uh, proof of stake is thought to significantly reduce the amount of energy consumption the network needs to run, upwards of 99% or more. Um, but it also makes um, uh, uh, validating the network and participating in the underlying economic model of the network much more accessible to the average retail investor. Um, prior to proof of stake, uh, somebody who wanted to get access to the block rewards for securing the Ethereum network, they'd probably have to buy stock in a mining company or they'd have to participate in a, a group mining scheme somehow. Um, now individuals can either spin up their own nodes uh, uh, by submitting 32 Ether. Um, and I have seen some home systems, it's not too, too technical. Um, or they can participate in a LSD, which is known as a liquid staking derivative. This lets individuals um, lock their ETH into a smart contract where somebody will then um, take that ETH and submit it into a node system um, separately. I think that this is going to really popularize a new economic engine for Ether. Um, block rewards right now are about 4.5% uh, last time I checked. Um, and that significant yield on a, a very volatile, but you know, often uh, uh, an asset like Ether that can appreciate pretty precipitously. Um, and so uh, uh, the idea that a lot of people can now be earning yield on their Ether uh, by securing the underlying network, I think that's very exciting for a lot of folks. And that's really going to make Ether a much more attractive asset class um, to a lot of retail and institutional investors. If one of the biggest takeaways of 2022 was, you know, if you're seeing a big potential for yield and it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. How is this a completely different thing? I think a lot of the yield that we saw that ended up hurting customers and a lot of the products that blew up, um, they weren't smart contract based. They weren't decentralized finance. Um, you know, in the case of Celsius, Celsius, their fundamental business model was to lure in depositors with the promise of these high yields and then find somebody else to loan it out to who would give them an even higher interest rate. Um, obviously, this turned out to be a very unsustainable model in terms of the uh, interest they were giving their customers, and they ended up blowing up because of it. Um, in the case of Stake to Ether, uh, the yield is coming from the block rewards. It's coming from uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that you are staking your Ether to secure the network, and in doing so, putting it at risk. If, you go, if your node goes offline, it will be slashed. If you submit a block with inaccurate data, it will be slashed. But this is all programmatic. Um, there is still smart contract risk. Um, the proof of stake system is new. Uh, we don't know if you'll if the Shanghai upgrade will go well. If you'll be able to withdraw your ether from the staking contract yet. Uh, and so I'm not going to say it's without risk. But the risk profile is fundamentally different from these centralized entities. And um, where the yield comes from, likewise, is a totally different product profile. And then real quick before I let you go, the Shanghai hard fork of Ethereum is coming up in March. Any idea or insight into how that hard fork will change staking after the upgrade? It's going to be a major catalyst for both the price of Ether and for some of these LSD tokens. Right now, uh, uh, individuals cannot withdraw from the staking contract. Uh, they can only sell their LSD issued tokens or they have to wait for the Shanghai upgrade. Uh, and a lot of people expect that there's gonna be a very significant bottleneck as individuals try and unstake. Um, I believe it's about 16 addresses every 12 seconds um, are the only ones available to unstake. Additionally, um, stakers have earned significant rewards. There's about a million ETH worth of aggregated uh, block rewards that they've earned for staking. Uh, and people who wish, wish to withdraw have the option to either withdraw their entire stake, taking their 32 ETH offline and their rewards, or just their rewards. And so there's a lot of different options for what could happen. People could um, withdraw their rewards and sell those. People could restake. People could, uh, you know, withdraw everything. Um, but I do think that it's, you know, uh, logically speaking, a lot of people would assume that there's going to be this rush to sell as withdrawals open. Uh, 
but the conventional wisdom is increasingly being that larger players are waiting to see that the withdrawals work and that the contracts function properly. And then they're actually going to stake more because an opportunity to earn, you know, over 4% on Ether is pretty significant for a lot of people who want to have exposure to Ether. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth right now around traders and prognosticators to see uh, how it's all going to play out. But it is a major pivotal moment to be watching closely. And we'll be looking at the on-chain data to try and figure out what's happening uh, once those withdrawals finally get. All right, that's all for Crypto World this week, but we'll be back again on Monday and we'll see you then.